כן, החלק זה הביוב אויב שלנו, באים, הקהל שלנו, הלאה בא בילדים. איך היא נפלאה, נכון? אני חושב שכל המשחק מחוק, דאגה ש... כן. דוד, שב על ידי, אנחנו עושים עיבול. Yes, so uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished speakers. Uh, it's my pleasure to start this event, which is an exceptional event in, in our museum, in the National Gallery, which usually hosts discussions on art, social issues, uh, more cultural issues, but of course climate change, urban development. So we believe that economic discussion is uh, directly related to all of those things. And uh, it's not a coincidence, but rather a rule. And, uh, you know, logical, logical sequence of all the discussions that we are having here, that today we are hosting uh, three exceptional speakers. All of them are economists, but economy is more art than exact science, so I believe uh, uh, their place in the National Gallery is most appropriate. And it is my pleasure uh, today to present uh, to you, physical audience, but also to the audiences that are watching us because of rain and traffic jams and because it's Monday evening. Uh, so I believe many of the uh, viewers have chosen to, to connect themselves via our YouTube channel and are comfortably watching us uh, tonight. And it's my pleasure to present uh, the pre three prominent speakers who are coming from Israel and United States, but all of three of them are somehow related to Lithuania. Probably they will comment this uh, later. And it's my pleasure to present to you Professor Avishai Braverman, with whom uh, we somehow spoke two or three years ago about such a discussion happening in Lithuania. And uh, fortunately, COVID-19 pandemic is more or less over. We believe so, at least. And uh, we are having this discussion. Professor Braverman received his PhD in economics from Stanford University and served for 14 years as senior economist and division chief. He has been a president of Ben Gurion University. World Bank, but uh, yeah. 14 years at the World Bank, but he has been also president of Ben Gurion University and turned it from a, a good institution to wonderful institution, if I can put it this way. Uh, but his most recent uh, decoration with the 2020 Israel Prize for a Lifetime Achievement, which is a Nobel Prize of Israel, uh, is really well merited and uh, it was awarded for a special contribution to society and state, awarded for his contributions as president of Ben Gurion University of the Negev, leading the transformation of the university, the city of Beersheba and Negev region surrounding it. So lots, lots of merits, uh, lots of context that he was active and not, uh, uh, I, I would mention another context, our discussions on, on uh, what we should do with the site of Grand Synagogue in Vilna. Uh, five years ago, we had really very deep, very important discussions. We are still not very far in practical application, but I believe that uh, somehow this also be addressed. Another prominent speaker is Professor David Zilberman. Uh, he comes uh, from Berkeley in California, and he holds the Robinson Chair in the Agricultural and Resource Economics Department, University of California at Berkeley. He is the recipient of the 2019 Wolf Prize in Agriculture and was elected a member of the U.S. National Academy of Science 2019. 
Professor Silberman served as the 2018-19 President of the Agricultural and Applied Economics Association. He is a Fellow of Association of Environmental and Resource Economists, European Association of Environmental and Resource Economist and Honorary Life Member of the International Association of Agricultural Economists. He has published lots of articles, 350 refereed articles in journals ranging from science to ARE update and has edited 20 books and uh, merits continue and continue. I believe during the discussion you will reveal more, Professor. Uh, last but not least, we, are, we have Dr. Yeshai Ashlag, who is entrepreneur and an expert in the theory of constraints. Currently, he is a senior partner at Goldrat Consulting and the founder of OneBeat, a retail tech startup. Yishai holds a PhD in economics from Bar Ilan University. Upon graduation, he was visiting scholar at the Wharton School of Business. Yishai has published four books. His last book uh, is called The Noise Factor, and it was released in 21. So uh, now you have more or less understood the range and the scale of our speakers. I will say, uh, at least maybe some words about uh, why this discussion is happening. This discussion is happening precisely that world is finding itself uh, in an unprecedented uh, serious situation where here we have war in the neighborhood, we have uh, COVID-19 pandemic just ending and causing a turmoil in, in economic, political and social spheres. Uh, we have social and political unrest in many countries, uh, not least the United States, and, uh, and so on, and so on, and so on. And we have very bad forecasts for this fall, uh, naming the economic recession and, and various uh, further uh, social tensions connected to that. So uh, such is the context, not very optimistic, but having such people on the stage with their bright ideas and examples from Israel, United States, other international contexts, uh, I believe we can hope for a better future. And with this, uh, I'm stopping my introduction and I'm letting you to do the rest. So Professor Braverman, please, uh, probably you will initiate the discussion and your other prominent colleagues will continue. So please enjoy. Uh, uh, I think we should welcome the speakers with applause. Achi Arunas, I was fortunate uh, Thank you, Achi Arunas. I uh, first want to thank you. We came here by coincidence, and I'll explain. And uh, first, to salute you, that uh, to salute Lithuania in the face of the corrupt autocrat dictator Putin that uh, is reminding us again from the days of the 30s that uh, the brave position of Lithuania, which is not simple, and we just uh, salute you and, and just a heart with uh, Ukraine and with you and the people that uh, still want to maintain uh, liberal democracy and uh, the values that uh, Europe aspired to have uh, after the war. Now, why are we here? I always say that I quote Albert Einstein, that coincidence is essentially the way God pretends to be anonymous. I look at all my life, and when sometimes I give lectures about success, I say, what explains human beings' success? The most important thing is the date of birth of location of birth. If I was born maybe 30 years ago, maybe I was in the gate chamber, maybe 30 years after, I wouldn't amount to nothing. With your parents, with your friends, it's about 90-95%. Then it's your talents, which is genetic, it's not also yours. Perseverance, when you fall, get up, when you fall, you get up. And when providence opens its arms to you, embrace it. I was lucky in my life, and I think David, Professor Zilberman, that is my friend since we met at Tel Aviv University 52 years ago. And not only that he's a close friend, 
I lost, when I came to Lithuania five years ago, I have the fortune to meet you, I they lost my suitcase. So I, Anna Vidan bought me all the clothes for four days until he came. So I asked David Zilberman, I told him I'm going to Lithuania, and he that is giving a major address on biotechnology in Rome on Thursday, he flew all the way from San Francisco, and of course when he came, he lost his suitcase. So what you see is my shirt that is dressing. So you see, friendship lasts uh, for a long time. But we are here, as I said, by coincidence, because I was five years ago, and there was unique experience for me. And then, about a month ago, Anna Avidan and Jenya visited Israel, and given the situation, etc., it came that we'll come and discuss some issue that maybe will shed some light, because we are, you know, 10, 20 times better than what's going in Lithuania. I don't know if we can shed some light, but flying from above, we can have some comments. And when Anna asked me, I thought I'll bring two friends with me, because we are like a triumvirate that doesn't kill each other, that really works together. David, essentially, I'm telling you, is really the expert in the world today on the also on the, not on the cultural economics, on the biotechnology, which is giving address in Rome. And one of the issues today is basically beyond the crisis of food security, etc., is the transformation of the agro-food bio-sector, and he will later address some of the issue on the world, on the biotechnology, bioenergy, and beyond the crisis. Ishai is an expert on transforming not with big things, with simplicity on constraints on companies, and also been addressing some small state in Nebraska and Utah, and it's maybe some of his experience can be relevant. But I'll start with the points that I want to share with you from the experience of my country and my own personal experience. So I look essentially, I'm the age of my country. I was born January 1548, so I'm four months older than my country. And Israel, as far as its success, Israel has failures, has problems, but if I summarize its successes, it has two periods. It was the period of creation, the socialist period, and it has a second period that we become semi-capitalist, whatever it is, and the two of them, two of this period are different. Essentially, the Jews in the diaspora, they didn't, they not, didn't have an army, of course, they've been weak. My grandfather had a farm. I'm, my grandfather is Lithuanian. My mother finished high school in 32 in Mariampol, you know. He, when I insist that he comes, he is descendant of Rabbi Eliyahu Agaon Mivilna, so he's also. So basically, you know, part of our heritage is there, and maybe Lithuania in this area was probably the only area that during the Russian Empire, Russian uh, uh, ownership of all this area, allow Jews to own land. It's basically many Jews have been farmers, mostly in this area in Lithuania. But most Jews didn't have agriculture. They didn't have an army, and therefore, in the socialist period, in the creation, in the beginning, the idea is we want necessity is the mother of all invention. We have to be strong, so we'll build an army, we'll create agriculture, human capital infusion of Jews that were physician and uh, you know doctors, etc. They become agriculturalists. That was the idea to come and create a very sophisticated agriculture and leading also in invention in water. As a matter of fact, I just mentioned that the guy at my university that died should have got the Nobel Prize, but he never got it. He was the first one in Sydney Lobb that invented the idea of reverse osmosis, if some of you know about the process of desalination. So in this period, that was it. And then come the other period. Socialism disappeared, whatever form of capitalism was, bureaucratic capitalism was created, and then Israel become what is called startup nation. I sometimes call it the exit nation because most of that goes outside, but what was the idea after? We invested tremendously in the army. 
the way the American invested in NASA, all the externalities out of the invested in the Army came for all sophisticated industry. The fact that we're leading in the world in the cyber came from the investment that we put into the Army, and then was the second aspect. What was created, young people worked together in the Army in this special unit that created a sophisticated uh, cyber and all kind of sophisticated uh, technologies, and they create certain bonding. When they move out of the army, they knew how to work together. It's similar what happened during our time in Silicon Valley, we both have been there, with the garage that people sing together. So the clustering effect of working together with the tremendous technology gave rise to the fact that Israel becomes second to Silicon Valley in the creation of startups. That's, I gain now a, three, a third point that will be relevant when we come to think from above about Lithuania. I came at the age of 42 from the World Bank to be a president of small university, again, event whose probability is zero, in the periphery, in the Negev desert, which was small university, with some centers in water, in bio, but a weak university. And we put the vision that we enlarge this university, will triple it from 5,000 to 18 or so, and build centers of excellence. And contrary to the advice that I get not to compete in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, I sought Alfonso Stanford, which was my alma mater, to take the university, build industrial park around it, connect it to the train, so it will transform the dormant city of the Negev to be another capital of the South. I was lucky. I was lucky because I came to, back to Israel, and David gave me a big push in that, during the Russian immigration to Israel, and high demand for higher education. So therefore, the government gave me support to increase the size of the university. But the truth, in my experience, government doesn't help that much unless you lead. Government often follow. Sometimes, I don't talk about Lithuania, after we've been successful to raise money and to move, the government move. But if I was waiting for the government, I would be waiting for Godo. And I was lucky, people supported, we created a small group that created mutual trust of respect, including David, friends of mine and people that were top scientists in the world, and some people with money, that with these people, I could move, because also in academia, like on this institution, most of the people are average, and they don't like change. The fact that we have growth and bring the money and give support, we've been able to create center of excellence. Around them, there was the creation of some cyber, but also in bio, etc. and now the area is relatively booming. When I sum that up, the question is, from this lesson that I had in my life, including the experience that I visited many countries and work on reform, the World Bank, I say, what essentially can I guide or consult without knowing much about Lithuania? Lithuania is a small country. It's three million. Relatively nice. Place is nice. The question first, we had ambition, both in Israel, that we wanted to create something. Both when I was at Ben Gurion University to transform something. Your life is good. GNP is $25,000 per capita. Everything is fine. Question, do people have the leadership and the intention in order to move to higher level or to be satisfied? That's the first question. If you want to move, the question is, what can make transformation from our limited knowledge, and maybe that I talk all bullshit, about Lithuania. Now, when the transformation took place in East Europe, Estonia jumped first, a very strong university in Tallinn, and they moved to the IT. Lithuania is not that strong in that regard. Lithuania today, because the world with all the crisis moving from the blessing and the worship of globalization 
for some regional and localization. So all of a sudden, the world that everything saw that everything is virtual and physical distance don't matter because you do import everything for China, you talk on Zoom, physical distance become important. You are close to Europe. You among the three gorillas, terrible Russia, Poland, Germany, but this proximity to Europe, which Ishai later articulated its implication with transformation of certain of the industries, etc., can be a special advantage to be utilized. Second point, we look briefly at the portfolio what you have. You have agriculture, you have lumber, you have some other things, you're doing not, not bad. But if you want to move, I'm not talking now over the crisis, the crisis will come. Eventually, even this dictator, I hope, I hope the world is not destroyed, Putin will be disappearing. And there is a period beyond, beyond COVID, beyond crisis, beyond recession, beyond inflation. And if the world survives, then the question is what will happen, for example, with the agro-food industry? David is the world expert on this transformation, and the question, do you want to move forward, for example, and create something around the new biofood, the new agrofood, or something else around that? In order to do that, you have to have a good human capital. The key issue, the way I was able to transform the area in Beersheba, is your, we met today the rector at the pro-rector University of Vilnius. You have a good university. The question is, do you have enough skilled, educated people that you bring also from high school that create a class of people that are educated and talented that if the university together with some indication of the government decide to focus on certain aspect in order to be a locomotive, can you invest in the university and create, let's say, a center in bio, certain disease, certain that? Many things are nothing. Life is simplicity. Uh, Ishai Ashlag, that is so bright, gave me a, 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 a metaphor. I don't believe in brainstorming. Brainstorming is often brain damage. I, in my life, that I was successful, I was sitting with few people that are very serious, we created something, and then we move, and then we create brainstorming that everybody come around for politically. Otherwise, it's becoming a mess. If you, Prime Minister, if the leadership of the university or here of the business want to take the vision forward and say Lithuania in 20 years will be a place with higher GNP per capita, but also a special center in bio, etc., etc., you have to start now by leading the center of the university. The university can affect the Vilnius or other places. And you move forward and you create, the way we create in Israel, a fund. You don't have, I just looked, so much regulation as the rest of Europe. And because you don't have so much regulation, if you allow the talented people that are emerging, when you increase the human capital here, you let them play and you create a fund in which clever people give people to play, and some of them, these seeds will become into flowers. Now, in order to do all of that, you have to have intention, commitment, and leadership. Because in my life, I learned one thing. I will close most of the business school in the world. The most important things is people, how you work with people, and not just having you know, papers that you throw to the ground. And therefore, I think this crisis is, pre is presenting Lithuania an opportunity if there is leadership and people are ready. For example, Israel is good in startups. It's terrible in long term. It was good in the long term before. If you can have a sustainable growth over time, maybe that can be something. And we say that we're just visiting here and, you know, we can assist you in that regard. And then I have one comment because of Arunas that is mentioning. You know, I think Lithuania is a small place. 
It used before the Holocaust to be a center. I talk now as a Jew, Jerusalem, the Lithuania, where the Enlightened movement started for the Jews, and also different phases, and also around, and then came the Holocaust. We saw that in addition, because for me, universities today, and I criticize also in Israel, become only a place for startups, economic transformation, the spirit of university and humanities is disappearing. And therefore, if in Lithuania, in addition, if you maintain, in spite of the tension outside, you create some place where you remember the past, but you pray for enlightenment, and you create some conferences with the university, when you bring top people to discuss the future of democracy, the future of the issue, but not doing with a fanfare like Davos. I was 14 years visiting Davos with lack of integrity and game. You do it in a more modest spirit as an integrity. So that's part of the tips that while we here, we share. And now I think if you will decide somebody to move on the agri-food and biotechnology, I'm presenting the best man that I know in the world that will give this lecture in Rome and just in the annals of the Academy of Science in the United States was just was article about him and he published an article that he will discuss briefly what he see how is the economy of the biotechnology and biofood and agrofood in the world where it's going and then give insights towards Lithuania and after that this master and I'm saying that I'm saying things that I don't know if I'm quoting I'll be shot because I have to be careful there are many companies that are doing consulting that I know with very famous name since I am on the podium, I won't mention the name. These companies charge $20 million, work for a, 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 a year, and give you a report. Most of the reports, they talk to the CEO, ask him what he wants, and then they do that, and then they move from all the places. Usually transformation and are very simple. This guy does it. You go to the weakest constraint, you do that, and you don't fill thousands of pages on all the uh, metaphors. So I would like later, after David Zilberman, Isha Ashlag to share, to share with you some of his experience, both about the benefit of proximity and then transformation of industry and maybe small states where he observed little and we know much, not much, not like you, some ideas that may be relevant or irrelevant to Lithuania. To sum up, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. I love Arunas. And we have good time, we drink well, and we eat well. So thank you for your hospitality. Thank you very much. OK, uh, good evening. It's tough to speak after Avika. OK, I am really, really happy to be uh, in uh, Lithuania. And uh, and it's really much, it's better than I expected. I think that it's his first time, and he is the great, great, great grandson of Rabbi Eliyahu. I brought him in. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 the the good thing is that it's it's uh, the potential of Lithuania is great. And as I said before, like in my life, I knew about Lithuania from my family, and then I knew about Lithuania from basketball, but I didn't know a lot about it otherwise. <laughs> but the more I think and the more I know, I think there are a lot of uh, opportunities. I think the recent war also really shows the spirit and, uh, the, and, the, and the courage of your country and all the countries that were able to fight uh, the dragon. And I think that to some extent, this is an area that I'll say later on, that is an area that can be an area of, uh, of transformation. And I'll uh, uh, bring a little bit from my experience working on issues of agriculture and food and biotechnology. Now, I, I'll start with an event that happened uh, this year. I don't know if you knew about it. There was something called the World Food Summit that was run by the EU, uh, by the UN, and I was on the science advisory board of the World Food Summit. There were about 15 people on this uh, science advisory board. And one thing that we realized is that there was a huge war on the future of food. I would get every day about 40 emails of people, uh, people that have a lot of ideas about the future of food. Most of them have something that was called agri-food, 
or organic food or all this stuff that sound really great. And it sounds great. It's good for European, it's good for people that run companies, but it's terrible for humanity because organic food produce less on a piece of land. You cannot grow it in Africa or in tropical agriculture. So to me, this type of solution is actually the negative. Another approach is the American approach, which is food plus you grow food to feed people to grow a little bit of biofuel. The approach that I believe in, and I think almost all the people that it wasn't planned and the science advisory board believed in, is what I call the bioeconomy. And I'll speak a little bit about the bioeconomy because it's relevant for, uh, I think that it's relevant uh, for uh, Lithuania, but I think it's crucial for humanity. Now, what is bioeconomy? Bioeconomy based on the idea that you can use the new discoveries in biology and you can use biological and natural resources, and I speak about forest and uh, agriculture and fish, to produce food, but not only to produce food, to produce fuel, to produce chemical. And the basic method and the basic challenge is to move from a non-renewable economy to a renewable economy. Now, why does it, why does it matter? If you look at our society, now, we are dependent on fossil fuel. They are non-renewable. Besides climate change, fossil fuel pre prevents the build climate. They won't last forever. They belong in few hands. And they really were, in a way, a, a good gift to humanity to have the Industrial Revolution, but it cannot last forever. Now, with the discovery of uh, modern biotechnology, we can produce a lot of the same material from plants. Now. Modern chemistry, most people speak about, uh, about physics, but chemistry is a cr critically important discipline. Modern chemistry, the raw material of modern chemistry is petrol uh, petroleum. But plants are the most sophisticated chemical labs in the world. They can do more than anything else to produce, to reinvent themselves. Now, Several years ago, people invent, started to discover, after the discovery of the DNA, they discovered how plant, how uh, genetic uh, material, living creatures, basically are able through the DNA and the RNA to re-manipulate themselves, to develop a system that makes us all uh, live and uh, prosper in this world. Some of the discoveries were made in the Lithuania. I think that uh, Lithuanian scientists did research that was crucial to the development of CRISPR, and in my view, it could have been part of the Nobel Prize in this area. So to me, by the, all this genetic uh, engineering is extremely important, uh, and, I see, and the bioeconomy, the modern bioeconomy, should really take advantage of it. As I said uh, later on, there are a lot of constraints. So the bioeconomy, basic, the basic idea is to use modern biology, to use new information technology, to use other uh, technologies to develop alternative sources of energy, alternative, so, alternative sources of medicine, alternative sources of, uh, of, of chemical. So you really move from a world that you depend on petroleum and other chemical to a world that is more renewable. So, Combining the bioeconomy with solar and uh, wind power, combining with bioeconomy with mechanism of, of uh, conservation, with input use, efficiency technologies, etc., you can move to a sustainable economy. Now, the bioeconomy is not new. The bioeconomy, if you look at the first industry in the world, it was a bioeconomy. Bread is a bioeconomy. It's based on the fermentation. Bread, cheese, kimchi, uh, wine, if you look still, to this day, the most important medicine in the world is alcohol. But the old bioeconomy has also other elements in it. There are a lot of lessons from the old bioeconomy, because many aspects of the old bioeconomy are risky. For example, alcohol. Alcohol is good to a certain extent, and it's bad to another extent. But what happened? People in the U.S. in the 1920s decided to have prohibition. It didn't work out. So now if you look at the modern bioeconomy, you have some interesting elements. In medicine, the modern bioeconomy 
is becoming a dominant factor. We wouldn't be able have, have a solution to the pandemic without all the RNA-based medicine. That is basically GMO type in medicine. But in agriculture, people decided that they don't use it, or they use it very little. Now, it's mostly done by European companies. Why? Because European companies that produce, that are dominant in the chemical industry, and they got experience in the past that, uh, <coughs> that they've done it for many years, and they were dominant, didn't want all this uh, competition from American companies. So to some extent, it was a short-term uh, effort to stop uh, new technology until they will have access to patent. But in the meantime, a lot of people are brainwashed. If I ask people, what do they think about organic, they say it's great. I think organic is great. If, if I have a company and I produce vegetables, I sell organic because there will be people that will pay more for something that doesn't worth more. And basically, if you're in business, you make money. But the reality is that all this, uh, that all this approach that Europe, uh, uh, that Europe advocates, in my view, is destroying Africa. Because in Africa, you cannot grow organic. You can grow organic in Israel. You can go organic in California because they are a desert and you, have a, a, and you have a lot of sun and a lot of water because of a new build project. You can go organic of, in some of Europe in labs and you can charge more. Another reason that Europe go organic because it can be protected from imports from other countries. But today the challenge of agriculture is not to feed European or American. The challenge of is to feed the rest of the world. The challenge of is to reduce the amount of land that we have in agriculture so we can produce fuel. Because otherwise, how can we get fuel for that? Uh, that because the, the sources of fuel that we have are non-renewable and they don't sequester carbon because plants are the best sequester of carbon. So you need to move land from agriculture to other activities, even in California, Third of uh, California, agriculture in California will convert it to solar energy. So you need to increase of, of agriculture and to use the land for more activities. That's the reason that I think that we need the bioeconomy. Another thing that relates to bioeconomy is, that is, uh, is the element of the importance of supply chain. Now, here is a digress to speak a little bit about what happened in economics. Economics, I don't know how much of you, you know about it, was started by Adam Smith, and it's a fantastic discipline for the, 19, for the 18th century. Mm -hmm. It's competition, small firms, everything is in equilibrium. It's almost, it's almost an orgasmic experience between very happy firms that are all competitive. The reality today is that we have a dynamic economy with a lot of monopolies, a lot of innovation, and we live in a society that is it's very innovative, and we have to deal with a system that is totally different. And in this system, I think the key element a lot of time is two things, are innovation and supply chain. And generally, I feel that there are two key supply chains, the supply chain for innovation and the supply chain for product. The supply chain for innovation is three elements. It has research in lab or by practitioner. It has development and it have basically upscaling that result in product. And then you have the other thing from the product to the consumer, to the final consumer. So let me speak a little bit about the innovation uh, element of the supply chain, because that is California and that is Israel. Actually, 30 years ago, I came to Israel and gave a talk about this type of topic to one of the big concerns. And I spoke about things that the people really didn't believe they exist. Ten years later, Israel became a, 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 a startup nation. It's not that they have anything to do with it, but things are very fast. And what happened in California? In California, since the 1980s, California was really threatened because of, the U.S. was threatened by the development of Japan. What happened was that there were a lot of innovation in industry, and no one used it. So they developed this rule that allowed universities called uh, a Bay Doll Act allow universities to sell the right to technology to companies. And what happened, we start having a situation that scientists in university develop new pro a new product, sold the patent to companies, and you start having things like Silicon Valley or other area where you have this infrastructure that research in universities is moving to companies, that research are entrepreneurs, 
And the university is not in ivory town, but it's basically the base for business. So if you really look at Israel and California and Boston, you have this element that is very important, that you have a scientific establishment that is that is basically linked with the business world, and there is a feedback between the innovation supply chain and the product supply chain. Now, once you have an innovation and you have a product, then you have to design a supply chain. You have to decide, I, I, you, would you, I would, first, will you develop new product? For example, when someone thought about personal computer, there is one product which is a computer, and all the other products are the, all the component of the computer. You have to design a market. The market structure is not competitive. Apple decided that they don't even use market, they use contract. More and more the world is, be, is based on contract. So you have obviously a pro problem of monopolization that we have to deal with, but that's the reality. So you have a world of new industrial organization that is different than what we were, we were used before that really allow you to move from the innovation towards uh, developing of uh, new industries, and they are coming all the time. So, so to some extent, this is a key part of the new bioeconomy, that you will have all these new configurations, that you use new knowledge and develop new type of organization, and you need creative finance to develop this uh, new system. And the big challenge is that the government, on one hand, provides the education and the knowledge and the human capital, because if you don't have the human capital to be, be, be in, this, in this business, you are in trouble. And at the same time, we'll deal with excess monopolization, with excess of exploitation. To me, that is our challenge as economists, how to do it right, how to balance the need for entrepreneurship with the excesses that are happening when few people control, control the power. But to me, for a country uh, like Lithuania that is now is starting into it, thinking in this term is very, very important. So what are, what are the, some of the lessons are, uh, out of it? The first thing is the importance of education of building human capital. And the importance of education is not only building top universities. It's important to have, but building from the beginning, encouraging kids, building good high school, and making, pe uh, uh, making people familiar with the world of research, making people feeling that they belong in a world of entrepreneurship and academia. Because one of, the, to be honest, my, the main advantage that I had from Israel, besides the fact that I got much better uh, education in mathematics than uh, the American, uh, my American friend, is that I grew in a family and in a country that I knew how academia worked. My mother, that, was, that had five years of education, knew what papers are and what tenure are. An American that came from Oklahoma did know it. And most people that come from Eastern Europe, they don't know it. So to some extent, you have to make people realize how the academic and research and all this stuff work. That it's not for the elite, that it's for everyone. That is number one. Number two, every regulation that are reasonable for humanity, not re reasonable for special interest, and not reasonable for the elite. Uh, to me, there is no big difference between what people call junk food and elite food. Elite food tastes better, but in terms of content, there is no big difference. People like me, I'm overweight, even though I don't eat junk food because I eat too much. And most people think about there is no big difference in life expectancy between most countries because we are designed to, to utilize the same nutrients. They come in different packages. So you need to develop regulations that would allow humanity to overcome all the challenges that we have and allow the bioeconomy to survive. And now you really have an important role because what happened in Europe, you have Germany, and uh, especially Germany that is entrenched in a certain paradigm. You have Italy that probably is the most bigger beneficial of the current uh, system. You have France that knows that you need to move to a different type of world, that you need to move to the bioeconomy, but because of the politics there. So to some extent, I think Eastern Europe can work with Holland and other countries to change the European system. So Europe now, instead of being to the obstacle to the world in terms of progress when it comes to the bioeconomy, will be the leading. I actually said it in the European Parliament. 
You think that you are more, most enlightened, but you are now new colonialists. You kill more people in Africa because you prevent them from eating food. So this is the other thing. Every, every, regulate, every regulate that are science-based, every regulation that don't make the life difficult for, in order to make it difficult, and don't all the time sway to the fear of every, of every group, but rather try to think about how to make humanity better off. I'm really feeling that the fear of the middle class will kill all of us. And they certainly develop a system of entrepreneurship. Now, in order to develop a system of entrepreneurship, you need to educate people to take risks and to manage it, have a good financial system, and also have a system where people are involved. Uh, like I, th so I thought about today with the university. I thought universities are not ivory towers. They have to be part of the, uh, of, of the community. And I think that the community should add this awareness. And that to me is one of the strength, strongest things in America. That I'm, I'm running a program called the Environmental Leadership Program. And the one thing that people were always surprised is that how come that people in America contribute to university, make donations to university, etc. To some extent, you, you have to realize that science is for, for people, and you have to educate people to use it, to contribute, to extend it, and to make regulations that science can be used. I really think that uh, Lithuania is sitting in a very good uh, place. There is a spirit of freedom here. People are, uh, are educated. The resources are good. I think there is a social cohesion. People are brave. And I think that if you really embrace the opportunities that the bioeconomy uh, can have and allow people to take advantage of their potential, the future can be uh, brilliant. And I would be ha happy with my friend to help as much as we can, which is very little, but still it's something. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, David. I think what David said something that maybe, and I'm looking for the some people that have more power than you, because he said that loud and clear, the gene editing and his friend Dudna, and some Lithuanian, she got the Nobel Prize uh, lately from Berkeley, gene editing for certain aspects that Europe does not allow are such an opportunity, you do it in many places. So if in this gray area, and you didn't give the example how Denmark or Holland finds this niche in the European Union on meat on other things to do certain things, that can be a niche that Lithuania can sneak around, not doing like Germany, and can create a major competitive advantage that can be supply food and other things in a creative way. I just wanted to add to that point. And now, since we talked, about transformation of industry uh -huh. and about proximity. Uh -huh. I'll ask our younger friend, Ishai, that work all over the world and have offices all over, what was his experience, uh -huh. both what he thinks about proximity, what he saw about Lithuania, and even that he worked recently in two small states in America, Utah and Nebraska, because one of the problems, how to transform government I was in, uh, I was a minister, I was chairman of finance. Believe me, uh, to transform government is uh, sometimes hopeless, but maybe you have some insights about transforming also governments. Yes. Please. As a consultant, I'll use slides. You know, I'm not sure consultants can talk without <laughs> slides. So that's a challenge. But I promised uh, Professor Bafferman that I'll make it short. So very few slides. Very few slides. I keep so many slides, I won't exactly. show you slides and say what you want. So I, I spent the last night just cutting out slides from the presentation. Just one slide on what is the theory of constraints. Yes. Just, yes. Just one slide on what is the theory of constraints. It's basically a way to manage systems. We, we try to simplify managing system by asking what is the goal of the system and then what is the constraint. And then trying to get closer to the goal by focusing on improving the constraint. Typically, if the goal is to deliver some value, you will have two constraints. One will be about how do you create value. The second one will be how you deliver value. And of course, this is very, very generic. You have to look at every situation specifically. But the idea is if you can identify what really blocks you, 
instead of thinking about constraints as something negative, we think about constraints as something positive. Because if we know what they are, we know, we know where to focus. We know how to really get closer to our goal. Um, when I looked at economic development, there are like four typical mistakes that I see, working with companies, working with different states. And I think the first goal is that success is measured by how many programs we can launch. People get excited and feel rewarded by launching a program. We have committees and we have multiple programs and for every problem we have a program. We don't have enough educated kids, we have a program for that. We have problem with retention, we have a program for that. And so on and so on. That's the opposite of system thinking. You are basically every undesirable effect, you are trying to address it directly instead of finding the leverage point. Where is the point that really can impact all that together? Also, when you are spreading all your energy on too many programs, typically nothing is achieved. You know, it's very hard to, to make any change anyway. So what we are really trying to do is, in economic development, focus. Focus on one or two major changes that can really make the difference. The second mistake that I see is we talk about confusing between economic environment and econ industry development. Economic environment is like, okay, what is your taxes rate or your taxes structure? Do you have access to broadband internet? How the infrastructure looks? And then I can have endless amount of parameters that are all nice to have. Everybody wants better infrastructure in all dimensions of infra infrastructure. But just doing them will not create a wealth for the country immediately. We can look at some Negative example, like even in Greece and Spain, where people were trying to push one indicator, invest too much in infrastructure, which eventually led to bankruptcy, not necessarily f to prosperity. Because the, the error was too long. You were investing in something and expecting that it will lead to something, that will lead to something, that will lead to something that eventually will create prosperity. We are looking for short errors. And the short error is, can we really help an industry to to prosper in our, in our backyard, okay? An example for that, if we look at bioscience, just, just, the, way, just the way we discussed uh, before me, and you look at where is the center of bioscience in the US? It's in Cambridge, okay? Cambridge has great universities, but also Stanford and also Berkeley, also the other side. But in the 70s, there was a very lax regulation that enabled gene editing in Massachusetts and in Cambridge, and it basically create an encouragement for startups to come to that area. And it gives the birth for an industry that developed there. And the question is, if we talk about what government is doing, what government can do in, the, in forms of education, human capital, regulation, even regulation can be an asset. Can we do something that really help an industry that exists in our area to prosper? And, 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 that's, and that's like the cornerstone for me for economic development. Because you take what you have and you try to help it to prosper. That leads me to point number three. Too many times we want to replicate an ecosystem that is established somewhere else. When I came to Utah, they told me, hey, we have already a strategy for economic development. We call it Silicon Slopes. What is Silicon Slopes? They are in the Rocky Mountains. There is a Silicon Valley. Now there is a Silicon <laughs> Slopes. Okay. Why? Because we have a great company. Adobe is here. Okay. okay, so you have one great company, and you want to replicate something that exists somewhere else. What is the chance, like if you are sailing in, in a boat race, what is your chance to get ahead of the next boat if you are following exactly the same wind? Nothing, zero, okay? This position already belongs to somebody else. You can't take that position. For example, in, in Israel in the 70s, when we were thinking about like automotive industry, we tried to bring f a assembly factory to Israel. A all of that was huge failure. Automotive become an industry when it relies on something unique that we had, like military knowledge, military experience that translated into relevant technology in algorithm and hardware that eventually translated into autonomous driving, etc. Okay, so like you see what your neighbor has, like whether it's Estonia, whether it's somewhere else, you cannot copy that. You need to, to build it on something you have in your own place. Okay, the last point is don't try to compensate for what you don't have by relying on incentives. Many times we said, hey, it's, the, it's only about, I bring my wallet, I take taxpayer money, and I start to give incentives to company to come to my place, okay? The last example I saw for it was, everybody was bidding in the US for where Tesla would put their factory. 
and Oklahoma and Texas were the last one. And Oklahoma offered way more money than Texas. And eventually it went to Texas. And the reason was simple. Texas is what that factory had to do, and a pickup, an SUV. What is the largest SUV market in the US? Texas. It was naturally gravitated to that market. Oklahoma is a three million consumer market. Texas is 29 million consumer market. Very, very different between them. So you, you have to, instead of trying to compensate for what, you don't, for what you don't have, you have to think, how can I do something that will create its own value and not cover for the lack of value that I have? Okay, that may be a little theoretical. I want to give two examples from my experience. They are in different stage of the implementation. And you know, what we do mainly in, in my consulting is mainly business. Government is like my passion as an economist. It's a side business for us. It's not the main line of what we do. And that passion also brought me here. When, when Professor Wavonman asked me to join to this trip, I said, better than doing business is just come here and enjoy a week in, in, in Lithuania. And basically the founder of our company, I just thought about it, Dr. Goldratt, he was a lead founder. Also. So we had another guy. So when we looked at uh, Nebraska, and we said, what are the challenges that we had? Basically, the problem was, no, problem number one there was an outflow of college graduate, okay? And second problem was 80% of Nebraska jobs require less than academic degree. Well, 40% of Nebraska population have their academic degree, okay? One lead to another. 90% of the jobs require no power experience. Despite low unemployment, wages are relatively low. Okay. Low level of entrepreneurship and productivity. Stagnant farm economy produced by declining commodity price. Okay, this was 2021, now commodity price is up again. But in the end of the day, most of that money is not retained with the farmers. It returned with the supply chain, with the distributor. Okay? Now, instead of trying to attack each one of these problems separately, what we did, we tried to look where is the constraint? What is the root cause? And the constraint is not always physical. If you talk about production line, yes, there is a machine that can produce less than other machine. But in, if you look at an economic environment, sometimes it's a policy, it's a belief. It's a way that you look at life that constrains you from really achieving more. Now, in this case, we, we had that vicious cycle. And what was the vicious cycle? Basically, Nebraska compete on economics of scale. They are trying to sell things cheap, okay? And there is pressure to cut cost, wage, and quality everywhere, okay? It, therefore, it doesn't attract a, enough high a value creation companies. Okay? Even if you look for Starbucks in Nebraska, they are hard to find. Okay? Everything is about cheap and Starbucks is expensive. Okay? So even that jobs are not there. Then the major industry in Nebraska are low wage, food processing, farming, etc. And the mix is not changing significantly. Now as this vicious cycle keeps going, you get the side effect that less availability of high paying quality job. And you have a surplus of a post a academic, post graduating a, a academic a people who leave the state. Now we realize that basically we need to find a way to break that vicious cycle. Now we couldn't come and say, okay, let's invest in startups. Because you have nothing there. You can't come and you cannot come now and say, okay, I'll pay companies to come. Because there is nothing else. You have to start and work with what you have. And in that case, they, that were the criteria for what we wanted to do. We said, let's look at the industries that we have, industries that we have, and ask how these industries can go up the value chain. How can we help them deliver, deliver, more, deliver more a value and, and make more money? So we looked how the government can create, create a gravitational pool in a specific industry that thrive to the extent that it meets the following criteria. It helps Nebraska industry to become number one in something. It creates a brand, not by doing a branding exercise, but by actually being very good in doing something. Okay? It attracts additional company talent and investment. Because you go for a higher value, you, you, you suddenly you need more marketing job, more supply chain job. You need other jobs to support, not just the basic jobs of creating things. And it creates high paying jobs for all level of education. What we really wanted to see is, yes, we, 
we support the academic world, you want to have more research, you want to see how you translate that to a white collar jobs, but you want to make sure that that strategy also is good for blue collar jobs. Okay? That, it, that you, re, you are not creating e economic inequality, that you are really pulling everybody together. Okay? And based on that guideline, again, we, because we are, you know, a, it, it's a year ago a effort, but based on that guideline, they focused on their uh, cattle and industry. And they said, we are one of, the, we have the best cattle in terms of quality, but there are other parameters to it, and we want to find a way to, se to separate our quality and to be able to sell it for, for more. You say cattle. Cattle, yes. Cattle, yes. Cattle. Cattle, sorry, yeah, my accent. A little. <laughs> okay, and we want to find a way to separate. So today, the Nebraska beef go together with Texas beef and it's all sale, so the customer almost cannot separate between them. Unless you are buying the super high premium price, you, don't know, you cannot trace the origin of the, of the meat itself. And, and what the government took on itself to do is to try to help separate the, uh, and, and identify the quality of the meat and other attributes, like the environmental impact, CO2, in, emission impact uh, to make that beef more special. Now again, it's just a one year effort. I cannot, uh, I cannot uh, report any, any success on that, but, but it's just to highlight how we think about the problem. It's a concise, concentrated effort in one industry that you're try really trying to make a difference that will make the difference for the whole economy in this case. Okay, another example. I moved to Luxembourg. And that, that example is taking me to, to talk also about proximity. Now, Luxembourg, the background was that basically Luxembourg rely on one major sector, the financial sector. Okay, and almost everybody who work in Luxembourg either work for the government or for the banks. You basically go on the street and you see somebody and you have a 50-50 chance. Is that government? <laughs> <laughs> and, and so so you, it's not very hard, you know. And, and they have a huge effort to try to attract startups or attract companies to come to Luxembourg, to reside in Luxembourg. And years ago, they decided to really attract Scandinavian green tech companies to come to Luxembourg. They had that, they, they had that uh, government arm, the Lux Innovation, they had a budget, they took army of people, sent them to Scandinavia to all where they are the leading in green tech technology, and they tried to convince startups, hey, come to Luxembourg. We'll give you tax breaks, we'll give you incentives, we'll give you free office. Apart from free food, they offered everything. Nobody came. <laughs> okay? Then the, then the, the way I got into it, sorry, yeah. The way I got into it, the guy who ran one of the initiatives, used to be my client on the, uh, on the business side. He ran the, an automotive company in Luxembourg, the only one that was there. And we helped him to basically accelerate the growth. It eventually was sold. He made an exit. He said, okay, I have enough money. He moved for the government side. The geologist he said, Isha, can we apply the same methodology here? So we c I came here, and instead of like being focused on what I want to get, I want to attract jobs, I want to attract company, I asked what I'm going to give. What, what I'm going to give to these Scandinavian companies is that they will come to me. And we said, basically, we have nothing. And in a way, eventually, we conclude we have one thing. We have our, our place on the map. Luxembourg is in, is in the center of Europe between France and Germany. And we said, how can this get into play with Scandinavian startups in green tech? And then we realized there are very different kind of startups. Some startups create like a smart tool to monitor your water leakage at home. Okay? That's a consumer product. I have nothing to offer them. But some startups are dealing with water treatment. Some startups are dealing with energy capturing from a steel company. And some people, some startups are dealing with, with how to store energy. And typically, all these kinds of startups, they need a demonstrator. They need to really dem create physical. some heavy capital investment, physical. physical facility to show it works, to prove it works. Now, if you make that in Stockholm or far, far away, it's very hard for everybody in Europe to come and see that. 
So what we said, what if what we are going to give people is not incentives and tax and other things, we will give them that we will help them put a demonstrator for only that kind of company. So what happened is instead of chasing all the startups, we focused only on startups that are capital investment and they need demonstrators. Then we said, okay, basically, before we even go and do the cocktails and go to Scandinavia and look for all these guys, we have to start inside, in Luxembourg. Like, what, what is the biggest steel company, cement company? All the environmental suspects, the guys that really have problems, and they need that kind of technology to clean their mess. And our, the government basically came to them and said, hey, we will help you to have a demonstrator that may solve your problem. So now the government is basically an agent to complete the information and maybe put a little push to solve environmental problem in Luxembourg by end attracting startups from Scandinavia. With this approach, instead of chasing 200, 300 startups, we had a list of 15 companies we wanted. Now we said, okay, 15 companies, it's not a lot. But we got a few <coughs> demonstrations from that and it, create, it started to create a virtual cycle instead of a vicious cycle. And what was the virtual cycle? Suddenly, the companies that need a demonstrator, they are, in, they are not in seed. The seed money is like for the early, early stage. They are already in the later stage of investment. Now, you have a financial sector in Luxembourg. You can come and say, when you come, I can also approach your investor and say, I will put money in your more mature fund to keep scaling further. So in this way, we started the momentum of really delivering value by focusing on how to grow an industry in Luxembourg because, because of physical proximity, only one thing. And focus, and focus on what, I, I'm not, if I go back to the beginning of my presentation, I'm not trying to rely on, I'm not compensating by incentive, I, because that's a lazy thinking. I try to think, what do I have? Okay, you always have something. I always give the examples of North Dakota, which I had a client there, a terrible place, but in North Dakota, there is nothing. Okay. There is really nothing. No people, some oil, no? <laughs> yeah, recently. But before the oil, they really had nothing. Okay? But they turned that nothing into one of the best flying schools, universities in the US, because less, you're less likely to crash on something when there is nothing. <laughs> okay? so, so even nothing is something. But proximity is definitely, is definitely something. And maybe just a last point, because I know we are already running late, when we talk about proximity, I want to talk about it in the context of industry, more than government. And basically, the traditional way supply chain used to work, and supply chain is like a bread and butter, they used to work on buying up front from the cheapest place, even though if it was the farthest place. Because all the people, what people accounted would care is, how much, what is my margin up front? And then they look for the smartest AI tools to predict what would be the demand, the forecast, and try to buy it. Okay? The problem is that the ability to predict is not getting better and better, no matter how much big data you have, no matter what algorithm you use, no matter what you do. And there is a simple reason for it which can be translated into statistical equation easily. The first driver is that consumers look for more choice, for personalization. I will not again boring you with a long presentation, I cut the slides, but almost every retailer that you look have more variety, more variety of everything. Now when you spread the demand about bigger variety, what happens to your ability to predict? It's just reduced by a square of n, just simple statistics. Uh, the other factor, what is the consumer tolerance time? People want things now. So they are not willing to wait. So if, they are, if I need to protect availability, what do I need to do? I need to increase my inventory. And now I'm increasing an inventory of a bigger universe. Okay, what is my likelihood to be accurate on this in inventory, no matter what technology I use? Nothing. Okay? And then the last one, product life cycle becomes shorter and shorter. If we talk, for example, about the fashion world, nobody talks about anymore about fashion. We talk about Fast fashion. Fast fashion like Zara and H&M, it's all about replacing the collection three, four times in a season, okay? So if my product lives shorter, but I need more inventory, and I have more variety, what is my chance of having the right forecast? 
zero. Okay? So if you really look, and now I didn't invent anything here, if you really look at, at, the, at the fast fashion world, one company is doing great from all from. Everybody is struggling last week from the economist. Zara is the only company that is really keeping double margin, double digit net margin and keep going and doing super well by doing one thing. They are producing clothes to the market. Okay? If they sell, if they buy, if they buy, if they produce in China, they sell in China. Okay? If they if they sell in Spain, it produced somewhere not that far, maybe in Morocco, but maybe in Spain. They produced in Europe, okay? Their upfront margin when something comes out of the factory is always smallest. But if you look at like, how, what is the percentage of full price cell phone? They said 65% of their inventory in full price. The rest of the industry is 45. So there is like 20% that you discount by 50%. You already lost 10% margin export, okay? So, so the ability, I think IKEA is the same. In any, I think IKEA is buying here for a local market. Yeah. It, the, the world, I think, if in the past, like I had a client in Brazil, the biggest fashion company in Brazil, I'm a client, they used to buy everything in China. It took me three years to convince them 50-50. So at least they bought the basic stuff, like the t-shirts, things that they will not have short life cycle, not a lot of variety. I got them from China. But everything that was fashion, I tell them, let's buy it in Brazil. I don't care if it's more expensive. It's near the market, and I can serve the market better, and I can make more sales. Eventually, you have a retail store. We have the retail CapEx, OPEX, all that, that you really need to, to, to throw products through that. And, and by having low supply chain, that won't happen. So I think if in the past it was, you know, it wasn't like a common wisdom, I think post the crisis we are going through, more and more people understand that. And I think it can be an opportunity also for, for Lithuania to think about what industries you have already here, not one that you don't have, that may flex their muscle and do something to go and, and be able to cater and serve better European markets due to your proximity. Okay. Did I make it on time? Thank you very much. I hope we didn't talk for too long. We saw you all kind of things. You know Lithuania. So if I sum up, physical proximity, strong education university, focusing on a couple of areas, not just in the crisis now, that you want to see 10, 15 years from now, and I will go with also David, maybe if the gene editing, you can find with your cleverness that European Union give you a certain chance to go, it's also a very good issue. But for that, the key issue, leadership, commitment for the long term, and few people that focus rather than trying to do brainstorming ad infinitum. Thank you for your attention, Achi. Thank you for the absolutely brilliant presentations. Uh, you agree with that. Yeah, and Antanas, please, you have a question. Uh, I think uh, microphone. We had five years ago. I said that I'm so glad to see him after a fantastic dinner we had five years ago. Yeah. <laughs> First, I need to excuse if I will ask stupid questions because I was talking uh, that there is no stupid questions. So the question number one, uh, Lithuania uh, right now accounts around 1% uh, from GDP in the life sciences, not only bio, but life sciences. And the Lithuania wants to develop life sciences up to 5%. Do you have roughly the estimate how much time it should take by having very, very strong effort from the government and from the, uh, the companies around. 
based on that there is one really strong company which uh, made this big progress in, in life sciences, that's the um, Thermo Fisher, which right now generates so one billion in revenues. That's question number one. And question number two, Lufenia discusses right now the strategy 2050. Do you think it's relevant to discuss 2050 rather than maybe 2025, 2030? Because 2050 will be a bit too, I would say, it's like, a, like something which you even don't know if that will happen. So thank you. Thank you. Too. David, why do you start with the biotech tool? Okay, now, uh, I think that if there is one thing that uh, I learned, at least uh, uh, from Ishai, is that uh, a key element is uh, common sense, and common sense is not common. <laughs> and uh, and so to some extent, like for example, he gave this example of incentive. Incentive are very good when the only thing that you need is incentive. But when you have some other problem, you need to know what are your problem and what, what are your strengths. So my, my feeling is, and this is a very difficult uh, thing for a government to do, is to have some sort of ability objectively to assess the strengths of the industry based on track record, com comparing with other people, what is the projection uh, for, for other products. Now, I personally believe that uh, you can do a lot uh, in the life sciences, but you really have to define what type of product you develop, how, how resilient you have in see if things don't, uh, don't work very much with your competitor. So to some extent, uh, you, can, you can move uh, much beyond 5% if you have the right product. So to some extent, it's very difficult for me to tell you the number without telling you, uh, without knowing the detail. Personally, I think, uh, I didn't say it, but if you really look about the war, several years ago, people decided, oh, we don't think about biofuel, we don't do it, we stop it. Now you realize that if you had more invested in the biotechnology and, bi and biotech, you could solve the problem of food as well as the problem of fuel. I really think that the world would be much more kind to people that try to solve these type of solutions. And if you have another three or four years when the price of agricultural commodity is high and you'd have a relative advantage in all this area, it can be very successful. Uh, the other thing that you have to recognize, you can be very, uh, very wise, uh, very think that we are smart, but it's cycle. Nebraska may be doing very well, very badly when the price of grain is low, and very good when the price of a uh, product is high. So to some extent, you need to have this ability to move and to adjust yourself and realize that a lot of times that your capacity in industries that are more commodity types have to change based on the situation. So altogether, I think that if you have the human capital, it's worthwhile to, to invest in uh, life sciences. What? Yes, the, the, now, uh, now, the second thing is planning. I think the 250 is a little bit uh, futuristic. I would go on something like 235 and 240. And the reason is that you have two type of decision. You need to decide about what type of infrastructure. It takes, for example, when it comes down to energy or when it comes down to even to, li uh, to the life science, when it comes down to university, you have to think about a 20 year horizon. Now we are about close to 2025. 2050 is too fast, 2030 is too, is too, is too short. I actually work with, with some oil companies, and they now, they start thinking about 2050 and they start moving to, toward 2030. So I really think to, to, think, in, think, to think about trends that have some chance to materialize. So if you really think that climate change will be a problem and there will be more uh, incentive uh, to, 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 for decarbonization, you have to develop, a in, uh, you have to develop an industry. If you think, for example, that there will be more opportunities in the life sciences, you have to think how we develop people that will be doing research along this time. You think about infrastructure, again, you have to think about it. But 2050 is, is, is too, too far. The last thing I think about any planning process, we met with the people that are in the planning process, you have to know what are your objective and what are your criteria. You have to know what you want to get 
in general, so you can evaluate everything before you do, you, you do, uh, you do the calculations. And I think that is a big challenge. To have the objective, to have, a, a, to have reliable people that you can, uh, that you can, uh, that you can give you prediction, and to have some sort of scenario that based on the present that would lead from the future. Because the future is still built on the present, and we're identifying what you can and what you can do. Uh, thank you. Andronas, I want to add to something with two examples, and as I know, I talk very bluntly, and then Ishai will talk from his experience. I don't believe in a very long processes of planning. That's the reason I like Ishai, because when he does, he go to the common sense and that I don't believe that people sit for a year and a half and consult and do scenario. It's simple. And then it's agility. It changes. And I gave you an example. In Israel, there was Ministry of Planning. Very important. People doing planning all the time. Many years ago, when Rabin was prime minister and I was close to Rabin, I think there was a young minister that get it, Yossi Berlin, he closed it. Because nobody reads these documents. Documents of planning. I can send him, I'm telling you to not Lithuania, to Estonia. In one month, you'll go to the key weak issues and you say what you do, and not do 10 years planning, you interview many scenarios, you see what is the weakest point, what is the comparative advantage. That's the reason I like this guy when I'm a prime minister or a leader of a company. I don't believe in the long processes that produce paper without common sense, and then nobody uses them anyhow. That's my opinion. And the second thing about numbers. Numbers are important, but not so much important. My first boss in the World Bank was Robert McNamara. Robert McNamara was a guy that as GMAT of 800 on only five, six people in the history of the United States in the, uh, matricula, in, uh, in the test, got it. He was a counted and a brilliant guy. He destroyed the, Ford corp the, corp the company corporation because everything was measured. Because who say that? Damien? Oh, the bombing. Putin, uh, you know that we are threatening him. Now, he then moved to Bay, the defense, this bright guy of Kennedy. He gave measurement. The Pentagon, the army, have to give me numbers. So they start killing civilians by the numbers and giving him numbers. When he was president of the World Bank, and I came a little bit later, 76, he was lucky. Why? Because this measure, the World Bank was a small institution, and it was supposed to be luck. So if David was in charge of India, he'll get promoted if he'll increase the lending, okay? But quantities by itself, that is not a measure. You look some quantities, and then you look at the key issue, you look at people, you look at spirit, and you navigate in indicative planning, and you do it simple. And then as the world change, you change, but you have a commitment for the long term. Agility, because Prices will go, life will go, but you say, I want Lithuania the way I was fortunate. In my university, I say people laugh at me, will be a train station and a park, and I build it, and I was lucky. Used to, but you have a commitment to something in simplicity, and you have key people around you that don't bullshit you forever on many documents or many things, because eventually you go to the key things and you focus, and then in 10 years, you will have a strong biotechnology, you do the agro food, you have a stronger university, and you have few issues that went, and you commit to that. And then, do I have to tell you how much? I don't know. But I know that sometimes luck, God, providence help if you have certain direction and commitment, and then the starry line. But don't do over planning and numbers, it's all bullshit. I did I make myself too strong, but I'm sorry. You know, we are dangerous, I tell you, dangerous. Okay.
I will try to do it uh, with less dramatic. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to put a point extremely yeah. because I saw country and companies wasting their life with all this game that doesn't lead to the key points and you can do it very fast. Again, I'll try to answer again, taking the caveat that we are not deeply familiar with, with the economy. The and and I, I would take it with a grain of salt. But our intuition was that when we talk about bio, we talk about bio, we don't see it as standalone. It's bio and agriculture together. So you're trying to basically leverage bio to also lift up the value added creation in agro. And because agro is 20%, if you find a way to do it, and I think what David was insinuating earlier, because you are small, relatively, and you are in the corner of Europe, if you can find a gray area in bio, that the European Union lets you depart from, depart, <laughs> <laughs> depart from, from, from the strict regulations that apply to the bigger countries, it can give you a jump start, an advantage, and then relatively quickly, quickly you can grow you can go to a substantial number. I agree with you that 2050 is probably too far, 2025 is tomorrow, 2030, 2035, even maybe 2040 is still something you can plan for. From my experience with companies and state, I always try to say that if you have a good direction, I can't wait 15 years to see result. I always talk about a value helix or a ladder, like I need to climb the ladder. I need to see what I do today is that in two, three years I can see it. Otherwise, people will start launch more and more initiatives because they need immediate satisfaction. Mm. And, but I also want to see how something I do today get momentum over five, six, seven, eight years period to something bigger than that. Now, I agree with, with the Bravo man that that kind of, of planning doesn't require years. It's something you do in months. Mm. It's either common sense that exists or it doesn't exist. I have one, one story and I give it to him. I used to have a friend, he died, Deichmann, a German a Christian that we met in a heart when I was just starting to be president and we became friends and he gave me a gift support. This guy, Deichmann, Deichmann Schuster is also here in Lithuania, started one shoe store, became the biggest private uh, shoeman in the world. And once a year, I go to clusters next to Davos, and we climb the mountain. And he taught me one thing. He said, Avishai, when we sit together, look at the top of the mountain. Then you have a goal. Then for one while, we go step by step by step. We don't walk. We don't go up. After one hour, we look back. We see we, get, we got something. Then we lift our heights. So you put a high objective, but then you start working in that with a commitment. After a while, a year or two, you look back and you see the signs. After a while, you see you reach the top. That's my lesson in life. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, okay. I, I want to ask a question. I think that uh, the key about planning is different planning, different items require different planning. I thought about it. The, for example, I work a lot in water. In water, you have about 30 to 40 years of planning because of the nature of the process. We try now to reduce it to 20 years, and it's a big challenge. In other areas, the planning is much less. So you really have to identify what type of areas you need, and you say, God, I would like to have an educational planning for about 20 years, energy planning for about 10, 20 years. Uh, on the other uh, end, for example, when it comes to food and agriculture, to have a shorter period of time. I also would like to think, what will be the mechanism that would reduce my planning horizon? The big advantage of biotechnology or the big, is that instead of taking 15 years to produce new variety of food, it takes five years. So to some extent, shorting planning horizon and uh, uh, being able to use common sense science to do things faster is a key element. So all the time try to be very efficient in planning because what happened, you reduce the uncertainty because the worst thing about planning is that all the people around you are, is, are looking and waiting till you will decide. So to some extent, planning itself needs to be optimized. So, the, the, so that is uh, the one thing. The other thing is, 
it's in addition to, de to develop in biotechnology, you need to develop the skill in the human capital, professional skill, professional skill, people that are technician. So it's not only having the top not researcher, you need to have the technical people that are, that are able to do it. So having an educational people, that, educational system that allow people to be able to enter to industry and operate, working with computers, knowing a little bit of biology is very, very important. That's what I said before. Having this linkage from high school to college that allow people to have a lot of skill is very important. If you ask me what the advantage of Denmark and on Holland is that they have incredible good human capital at this level, and therefore they can also go around the, EU, the world. They are the best in the world in developing uh, in the, in the biotechnology. So you not only think about God, what's the potential of biotechnology, but how do I develop an educational system and culture and background that allow people to be nimble. So I think this is, these are two really a key, a key elements in the question that you raised. Yeah, but Holland is big. We're in 2050, yeah. we'll be 2.2 million. So yeah. the question how to track that. You know, uh, Thomas, I tell you one thing that I've told, and because we talk personally, before Schroeder was elected the first time, I was invited to a group of people. Before he became councillor, you know, I'm old enough, I'm older than you. And he gave the vision for Germany. And I asked him, you know, you need 2.16 children per woman to maintain the population. You talk to me about the future of Germany. German women, the situation is 1.4 children, 1.3 per woman. If you continue like that, your labor force, your pension system is going to collapse. So you have either to tell the German women to make children or allow migration. So he told me, brother man, I cannot I run for politics. One of the issues here, I look at that. He walks around in Japan, he has office employment. Japan will die. If they don't make children, they will die. You have to consider also in Europe, you're relatively rich. If you don't make more children, Europe will disappear. Part of the issue here, if you look for 250, 60, if you continue 1.3, 1.4, you'll have a problem with manpower. You don't have children. So why don't you tell the people or do subsidies for children? Of course, I cannot speak like that. My wife will shoot me, but I, yes. she is not here. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I believe we have other questions, but before we do, uh, I would like to pay our attention that we find ourselves in the midst of museum. And museum itself is an industry. I believe we are offering unique products, and we have hundreds of thousands of visitors, the clients for that product. And I, I just remember 10 years ago, we ordered a survey on uh, economic input of creative sector. And the answer came, it's about 5%, in, in a broad sense, including publishing, architecture, film industry, museums, everything. 5% is like a milk industry. So my question would be, do you believe in, in the economic future of creative sector? Uh, we are supposed to have more free time in future. So what we are spending our free time for. Health and cultured leisure, uh, supposedly. But what is your take on that? Does, I'm not talking about Apple or Netflix. I'm, I'm talking about creative sector in general. So uh, uh, the microphone is very loud, and I'm horribly sorry for the bombing attacks we had in our loudspeakers. But as a creative institution, we need some, some part of fun here. You know, so. Tell you one sentence that we we'll discuss over lunch. Vilnius is a unique city. You feel it. But as one of the gentlemen I met, we just arrived yesterday night, said, not so many people come here. They go to Tallinn, they go this. You have to make it attractive because you are unique. So if, for example, what I said, you create a unique conference here that attract all over the world that are different. You create in creativity. All of a sudden, Vilna, Vilnius, that in our history of Jews, or Jerusalem, the Lithuanian, you create something here and people will come. You have to create a product differentiation and attraction culturally with special conferences, with special things, not like Davos or Germany or Poland, but something unique that fits your perception, 
your views about tolerance and enlightenment, remembering the past, praying for enlightenment. Make Vilnius the center inside of the Putin and the Rodman, I want to talk about that, that will be a center of attraction for conference and culture for praying for enlightenment. Do it, Arunas. Yes. <laughs> now, I, I, I think, now, seriously, they obviously, if you look at the biggest companies in the world in the last day, uh, Facebook, Google, there is a huge interest in culture and knowledge. Uh, I remember, uh, see what happened in the pandemic. The, now, the key challenge is how to use all the I heart and to make money out of it. And you have movies, you have TV. Uh, if I look, even if, if I look, uh, if I look at uh, what happened in the last several years, you see incredible new players in the in the movie industry, in the entertainment industry. So, to me, a key element is to be able to take your uh, scientific achievement and knowledge to to create things that can appeal for everyone. If I look at Israel, Israel suddenly became a powerhouse in producing videos. If you look at Korea, they can, there is no reason that you don't do it. But again, if you use it, the tradition of illness and the story that you have here, and not only think about having, going high, I think the biggest enemy of, high, of uh, the business of culture is trying to go too much high culture. So my feeling is that, again, I think, look at the US, the biggest industry that we have now, is the movie and entertainment, and the U.S. now control uh, is much bigger in the world in entertainment and in videos than any other country. So my feeling is, don't be afraid to have mass appeal, but rather to try to encourage, encourage creativity, build studio, make people that try to develop new, uh, encourage people to take risk in the in the creative art and try to bring art to the people. And uh, I think that there are huge potentials there. And I really think that, again, Europe didn't take, didn't take advantage of it as much as the US. And I think that Asia now take over, and Israel take over. And I think that, to some extent, in Europe, there is this element that culture is not to make money. If you don't take, it said, if, you do, if, if there is no, uh, if, if, there, if, any case, if there is no money, you don't have learning. And if there is no learning, the, so you need to find an element where the learning can be an economical, and you need to know what, the, what is appealing to the, to the crowd. And if you do it, I think you can make Vilnius much better, you, you, can, you can identify your uniqueness, and you can co uh, commercialize it. So to me, the key problem of humanity is that a lot of times they don't realize that they have, that they blame people not buying them rather than provide people something that they want that they, they would like to to pay and a lot of the stuff you can produce high quality art that will also be appealing and to me this is the biggest challenge of academia and uh, the creative arts today i think we took for too long you are very patient for listening to two old guys and a younger man telling you stories. If some of the stories appeal to you, maybe Antonas you take it, and you people in Lithuania find a way to get something so in our next visit we'll be delighted to see a beginning, and whenever you need something, we're willing to support you, because somehow we have a heritage here, and it's nice to help or support people that want to do something good, something beneficial that is not just about me, me, and me, and how rich in the world I'll be. That's collectively, as a society, developed together. Thank you for your attention. Aruna, thank you for hospitality. Next time, I'll buy you a cafe again in Tel Aviv. Thank you very much.